one roof does a, a number of things, affordable housing related in the community. Um, we do home buyer education and counseling. We do uh, education and problem solving and mediation for tenants and landlords. We develop and sell affordable homes and we develop uh, rental housing, affordable rental housing, and we also make loans to homeowners and to landlords who want to fix up their properties. So um, there's information on the table out there about us if you ha have needs or interest or uh, would like to plug it to us in, in some fashion. On behalf of the League of Women Voters Duluth, I would like to welcome everyone and thank you for coming. We would also like to thank our co-sponsor, One Roof Community Housing, for hosting us in their space. The League of Women Voters is pleased to present this general issue pre-primary forum for the 4th District and at-large candidates running for Duluth City Council. We thank the candidates for their willingness to participate in city government and in this forum. The League of Women Voters has had a presence in the Duluth community as a nonpartisan political organization for over 90 years. Our mission is to promote citizen involvement in government and increase public understanding of major public policy issues. We believe that an informed citizenry is the foundation of effective democracy. The League is open to membership for people who are interested in nonpartisan civic participation, and you are all invited to join. If you'd like more information, you can pick up a membership form tonight at the information table in the hallway. You can talk with one of our members, including myself, or you can check out our website at www dot lwvduluth.org. That's lwvduluth, all one word, <coughs> dot org. Because the league structures our forums in a way that promotes civility, this is a civility certified event. We'd like to thank the Duluth Superior Area Community Foundation for their civility project certified events information and guidance. At this time, I'd like to introduce Catherine Lenz from the Civility Project. This evening, you received some materials from Speak Your Peace, the Civility Project. Um, this uh, green card has the nine tenets of civility, um, and the white sheet has um, the expectations for you, the audience members, um, throughout this event. <coughs> Speak Your Peace, the Civility Project is an initiative of the Duluth Superior Area Community Foundation and the League of Women Voters Duluth. The Foundation and the League of Women Voters Duluth would like to thank in advance the candidates and you as the audience members uh, for your cooperation. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan volunteer organization that works at the local, state, and national level to encourage citizens to participate in government. While we as a league do study and take stands on issues, we do not endorse or support political parties or candidates. The views expressed at tonight's forum are those of the participating candidates and not those of the League of Women Voters Duluth. Additionally, League sponsorship of this forum is not a League endorsement of any of the individual candidates participating. And at this time, I would like to introduce to you the candidates. Fourth district candidates are Tom Furman, Howie Hansen, and Renee K. Van Nett. At large candidates are Zach Filipovich, Janet Kennedy, Barb Russ, Brandon Sorbet, Rich Updegrove, and Richard L. Williams. Our forum tonight will begin with the candidates giving a one-minute opening statement followed by a questioning round. First to be asked are questions solicited and vetted by our organizing committee. These will be followed by questions from the audience members and questions received on the League website, as our time allows. Candidates were not given the questions in advance. Each candidate will be given one minute in which to provide their response. The questioning round has been set up so that each candidate will be asked questions in a rotating order. The order in which candidates will respond was determined at random, and we will rotate the responses throughout the evening. We would like to encourage audience members to submit questions of their own. Index cards were provided at the door and at the back of the room. If you need cards during the forum, please raise your hand and someone will bring them to you. Please write your questions on the index cards <coughs> and pass them to the end of the row 
so our volunteers can collect them. Um, who are our volunteers tonight who will be collecting? Catherine, um, can you stand and kind of wave so people can see? Thank you. So if you write down your question, make sure you get them to the members. All submitted questions will be assessed for clarity and bias. Those that fall into the same general category will be consolidated. This will allow us to cover as many topics as possible in our time allotted. Questions that are deemed unclear, hostile, or of a personal nature will not be used. All questions become the property of the League of Women Voters. After the questioning round is completed, each candidate will be allowed a one-minute summary statement before the end of the forum. The candidates will now provide their prepared introduction <coughs> statement. We'll begin with candidate Brandon Sorbic. Good evening. My name is Brandon Sorbic. I'm running for at large. Uh, I am a husband to my beautiful wife. I have three children who are six, four, and 20 months. Uh, with my six month, six year old, about six years ago, we discovered that he was born with a heart condition and hypothyroidism, which in turn led us to having massive bills and deciding whether we should pay our bills or if we should pay for food. And with that, we learned how to cut back and cut back and cut back, but unfortunately it didn't pan out. And I moved back here about four years ago from that. And in living here, I have seen that Duluth has not increased in jobs, which I am trying to work towards, and also towards a more balanced budget of our city, along with you know increasing our job base and trying to help our citizenry get affordable housing. Our next candidate will be Holly Hansen. Thank you, and thank you to the League of Women Voters for hosting this event. It's a great turnout. This is always one of the most exciting ones that uh, we get to partake in, and I think the other counselors who have been through this before would agree. Um, and it's very fair, and I really appreciate that. It's a level playing field. Um, my name is Howie Hansen. Tonight I'm here with my, my wife of nearly uh, 38 years, Beth Hansen, and uh, we have two children, uh, both College of St. Scholastica graduates, somehow. <laughs> and uh, one is a Duluth, or a, a, a Blaine, Minnesota uh, music teacher, our son Ben, who's about 35 uh, ish, and uh, our daughter and I, um, who's 26, 25, 26, are both going to be starting working on our master's degree in business at the College of St. Scholastica this fall, so I'm looking forward to that. Clearly, uh, my, my position, political position as 4th District Councilor has been I'm fighting hard for taxes, for lower taxes and, and lower fees. That's, that's uh, what I believe that the, the people in our district want and, and I'm committed to that and will continue that effort. Good evening, and thank you to the League. Um, Holly is correct that um, uh, these forums are always um, you know, very level playing field, as you said, with good questions usually and good uh, attendance. Um, <coughs> okay, sorry. Okay, um, so um, I, um, I moved to Duluth at the end of 1979 when I graduated from law school, and I got absolutely the best job in the world at the St. Louis County Attorney's Office. And I retired there in 2013, and about a week later I got a call from uh, Don Ness, he was still our mayor, and he um, asked me to um, file at large because someone had decided not to. And so at first, my first response was, why would I want to do that? I just retired last week, but um, he talked me into it, and uh, so here I am, and um, the last four years have been very interesting, learned a lot about the loop. And um, I'm looking forward to uh, four more years. Uh, my passion is housing. When I first, um, <laughs> that goes fast, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Our next candidate is Zach Filipovich. Uh, hello, my name is Zach Filipovich. I want to thank the league and thank you all for being here. I'm one of your current uh, city councilors at large. And I think that I am one of your city councilors currently, and I'm running for re-election because I love Duluth so much, and I believe everyone deserves the opportunity to make a good life here. 
I grew up in the uh, east uh, hillside next to Chester Creek, and I'm the proud son of two incredibly hardworking union parents. I graduated from Blue Central, that's where my campaign colors come from, go Trojans, and um, I worked my way through college at UMB, and now I work at a, as an accountant uh, downtown for a family firm. Um, I'm proud of my experience on the council. Last year as council president, um, I brought forward the issue of earned sick and safe time, which I hope we get a chance to talk about. And um, I've seen both in my job and as a council that we, when we support economic equity and have everyone share in the growth that we have experienced in Duluth, we are going to have uh, resources to provide for all the things that we need to provide for. Thank you very much. Our next candidate will be Richard L. Williams. Uh, good evening. Uh, I have the privilege and honor of running for council, council at large. Uh, I, uh, I, was, uh, I came to Duluth uh, because of a job at Lake Superior College. I became a teacher there in electronics, and I've been in electronics my whole life. I consider myself a troubleshooter, uh, which uh, I think uh, would, would help me in my job as, uh, as a representative of Duluth. Uh, with people, and uh, you know, troubleshooting is like problem solving. It's, it's very similar. Um, Duluth is uh, needs to be fixed. I believe they have problems with money. <clears throat> Part of it is that uh, there's 86,000 people. It was probably designed for 110,000 people, and if we had more people, there would be more revenue. And uh, so, I, I one of my goals is to try to bring some manufacturing to uh, Duluth so that uh, we get some younger people uh, in Duluth. Uh, probably have to be. Our next candidate is Rick Updegrove. Good evening. My name is Rich Updegrove. I'm a high school social studies teacher. I teach law, economics, and American government. And uh, I'm excited to uh, bring the passion and energy that I have for the future citizens that I, that I teach um, at East High School to uh, the City Council. I have a 9-year-old and a 12-year-old. We're raising them in the house. We're the fifth generation to be raising children on my wife's side of the family in the same home. Uh, that, uh, that draw to Duluth has, has been a big part of why I want to be on the City Council. We are one of the most amazing cities, I believe, in the world, but certainly one of the most amazing cities in Duluth. And we can do so much more than we already have. We're moving in the right direction. We have a homeless bill of rights that's a resolution that should be moved toward an ordinance. We have a, a push for an earn sick and save time that needs to be a full ordinance and fully supported. I'm very excited to be part of all of that as someone who grew up in a trailer park with very little economic well-being. I'd like to extend that to more people. Thank you for all for being here. Can you hear me back there? Yeah. Fantastic. All right. I am running for the for the fourth district because I believe that we need a time when we can change the world at this point in time right here in Duluth. And that starts with making sure that our our representatives represent the people in a transparent, clear way, in a clear voice, a message that resounds with everyone. Now I realize that for many people, the fourth candidates all seem to be the same thing as what I hear. I want to guarantee you that is not the truth. We are very different, and I can tell you that I have been strong against the idea of making sure that we don't get away from the idea of letting Polymet run, run amok. We have to have an evidentiary hearing, and we have to push forward these ideas, earn sick and safe time, and I believe that everyone that's running needs to stand up on their issues and make it clear where we stand and what we need to do going forward. Thank you very much, and I look forward to hearing much more from you. Our next candidate will be Renee K. Vanette. Hi, I'm Renee Vanette. I'm running for Fourth District City Council as well. And um, I have a licensed foster home. I just moved out of Lincoln Park to the Heights, and it's a brand new life, kind of. And it's really interesting and fun and time consuming. Um, my girls are going to Lincoln Park. I'm super excited about them kind of moving forward and getting a little older there. Um, really concerned about public safety. It's a big thing for me. I need to make sure people, people everyone feels safe no matter where they live, everywhere. 
Um, I'm, an, I'm an employment navigator at Community Action Duluth, and I help every, people get jobs every single day. That's what I do. That's how I feel about how we can do better. And being a, an accessible candidate, or being an accessible person to help get our needs met here. So I think, for me, it's really important to be to be that bridge for everyone in the district that, to ensure that we're all at the table, that we all get our needs met, we all get listened to, no matter how we do it. I'm all about the work. That's where I'm at. I want to get things done. Thank you. Our next candidate will be Janet Kennedy. Yay. Hello. <laughs> My name's Janet Kennedy, and I'm running for Duluth City Council at large because I believe a community can survive and prosper as a whole when we're all walking on even ground. And what that means is inequality hurts everyone. You know, it's really time that we start making a difference in Duluth. Mm -hmm. And what that difference means is making sure that we have boards and commissions and even the city council where we have everybody at the table. What can happen when we don't have that? And a lot of things I've learned from being on the planning commission, building a nonprofit. I'm also president of the Spirit Valley Neighborhood Development Association, is that when we have voices missing, we can have unintentional consequences, and like we have now, an 11 year difference in life expectancy. That should not be happening. That happened um, over the last few years, and I'm ready to make that change. One of the things I learned through my church and my mom is to give back, and that is why I'm running for city council at large. I'm a person who raised their children on welfare. I was raised on welfare. I believe in giving back to my community, and I believe that I have the expertise and the experience that the city council needs to move Duluth forward for everyone. So I believe what uh, the city has done and, and needs to continue doing is working on mixed, ho mixed development housing. I think that we are doing a good job as a city addressing the fact that we have a affordable housing crisis in our, in our city. And the mayor mentioned in her State of the City address that if there are three things that she's focusing on, that's one of the three, is making sure that people who are making under $50,000 a year are having more affordable housing available. So One Roof, for example, where we are sitting now, is an organization that is, that is working uh, in that direction. Having been someone who, in order to buy a house, had to attend ACORN uh, sessions to learn how to pr how to own a home coming from a family that did not own their own home affordable housing and making that housing available is incredibly important and we think about who that uh, impacts in our society uh, single mothers people of color these are people struggling in our community that we need to reach out to so the question again is what is your understanding of the ways the city has supported slash can support affordable housing, and what is your vision for how this might change in the future? The next candidate to answer is Renee Van Nett. Change in the future. Thank you. I am um, living in that moment right now. I just bought a house. Just bought it. And talking about what Rich said about learning to how to do that whole process, I believe that people need to be able to do that. Having an employment, having a job, 
being able to do that is exactly the path that I was just on. And how to do it is to learn to, I think the city supports that <coughs> in general. I think people really are super happy that I was able to buy a house so I can add to the taxes. I'm like, yay, I want to be able to add to tax, yeah. Because that makes me excited to be able to move forward and help other people move forward and that I can do it, they can do it, everybody can do it. And I think it creates partnerships, how we do that with one or if I work with one or community action, do it with LSS. Those partnerships helped me to be, to figure out the system. It was really important for that. And I think that more people can do that with the coordinated entry system, community action, we, where we are, we work on that. We work with them, with coordinated entry, and how people get jobs, how we troubleshoot, how we get housing, how things work. So I fully believe that this community can do it. Sorry. <laughs> The question again is, what is your understanding of the ways the city has supported slash can support affordable housing, and what is your vision for how this might change in the future? Our next candidate to respond is Brandon Sorbet. Well, as somebody who's been living below the poverty line for the last four years, I have been working my butt off trying to get myself in a position where I can buy a house. I've been working up in my job for the last four years. I've been working through one roof with help to try to get all my affairs in order. And I think one of the ways that Duluth can really help is by trying to reduce the fees and regulations on some of the housing that's out there. Because from what I have looked, I have seen places where they're going for $1,000 for an efficiency or a one-bedroom apartment, which is completely out of the price range for most people. And that is highly ridiculous. I think that one way is for Duluth to reduce some of the uh, fines and fees of people trying to set up places where they can charge a little bit less for housing. Thank you. So the question again, what is your understanding of the ways the city has supported slash can support affordable <coughs> housing and what is your vision for how this might change in the future? Our next candidate to answer is Barb Russ. Thank you. Um, affordable housing is uh, something that's very important to me. And one thing we want to do that we have been doing differently is it should be built throughout the entire city, not just in one or two neighborhoods. I got to pick where I lived, wanted to live when I moved here, and everybody should have choices, and that came out of the, the summit this year. People wanted to be able to have choices in which neighborhood they could live in Duluth, and I think it's really important. We need affordable housing, we need housing at all price points as well, we need housing um, for uh, single family homes, we need to have just a variety of, of building going on over the next few years. First of all, it's easier to get manufacturing to want to come here. They're, they they want housing for their their um, employees, and that's been a problem. So we there's a lot of things we can do. It's it's tied to our um, not only to uh, housing for specific individuals, but it's for an, our economy. It's very important for our, our economy to be able to have enough housing. In an effort to save time, I won't repeat the question every time, but if any of the candidates, if you want me to repeat the question, please ask and I will, okay? All right, our next candidate to answer the question is Howie Hansen. Thank you. Uh, in my first four years on the council, one of the areas I think that I've really had a lot of passion for and, uh, and worked hard in is in the housing thing. And it's not a real sexy thing, but a lot of things, a lot of moving parts behind the scenes and I'm really proud of what we were able to do by supporting the ND project, the Kenwood project, and, and the Bluestone developments. And in each of those cases, I personally met with the developers long before the first shovel was in the ground and, and shared with them what my perspective was as a small businessman in terms of um, you know, what the need was and uh, what the expectation might be of filling those those uh, various units. And, and I'm proud to say that even today, when I looked at it and reached out to the to the ND um, uh, developer that uh, they're doing really well there. And uh, so we clearly have done well on the, on, the, on, the, on the workforce housing, the market rates, but we haven't done a really good job. And I'm on the, um, on the affordable housing piece, and I'm really looking forward uh, with another four years of, of being able to work hard behind the scenes again in that regard. <coughs> Our next candidate will be Zach Filipovich. 
Thank you. You know, I have a lot of friends who have moved outside of Duluth because they can't find affordable housing. Um, and this is this is a multifaceted uh, um, issue in Duluth. And Barb is is exactly right. It affects our economy in a great way. Um, it, uh, it we need housing at every level. And I think that we need um, mixed use housing and mixed income housing at every level, um, all across the state. You know, working with with the council, I know that we have a lot of partnerships. One Roof Housing is a fantastic example. Um, I think. One of the first things that I co-sponsored was with uh, Councilor Joel Cypress to get um, initial funding for the Tenant Landlord Connection, which is something that Jeff was talking about before this started. And it's something that we do need to do uh, a bit of a better job on, encouraging developers through uh, um, responsible TIF districts and partnering with the county uh, with tax abatements like we have done earlier this year for um, middle range income level housing. Our next candidate will be Janet Kennedy. Oh, I was looking for a microphone. I'm so sorry. I was waiting for a pass. Because I like to drop it after I speak. <laughs> so um, being on the planning commission, um, I understand that we need all types of housing. We've done a lot of work in the last couple of years on the planning commission and with the health and all policies. I'm making sure that we have healthy um, and um, fair access to housing, transportation, economic development, open space, and energy. But specifically for the housing right now, there actually is a, 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 a targeted housing strategy that's an interim for the comprehensive plan and reinvestments in housing. And so that's one good thing that we're currently doing. One of the other things we need to make sure to do is as we move forward through that comprehensive plan for housing, we didn't make, need to make sure that that gets implemented and implemented according to the principles uh, of the governing principles in the comprehensive plan. So I'm going to be excited to move that forward as a commissioner. We, we know that sometimes we can make policies and even though they get made, they're not implemented. And I know for sure that when I'm on the council, I'm going to be implementing the work that I've been doing for the last two years and making sure we have housing for everyone. Our next candidate to answer will be Tom Furman. <clears throat> yes, this is a very complex challenge that we're facing. This is a crisis in Duluth right now. We do need a lot of different solutions. There are a lot of moving parts. And yes, we do need mixed income, mixed locations. We need mixed use housing. We have all these, pet, these things going on at the same time, but we also need to add the other component, which is income. Now, right now, Duluth is suffering from a lot of people that are struggling, as mentioned earlier on. We have a huge background deficit. It's not just the people that are renting that can't afford it. It's the people that are also living in the houses right now that can't afford the houses that they're living in. This requires us to make sure we get good jobs here locally. And that means starting with making sure that we have manufacturing jobs that are going to be green oriented, renewable resource oriented. Now there are a number of things that we can do to really make sure this is implemented here in Duluth. And it starts by making sure our system is set up for success not just entrepreneurs, but for workers in general as well. And that means starting with things such as earn sick and safe time, making sure that we have that to lean back on. But it broadens beyond that point. I'll stop now. Our next candidate will be Richard L. Williams. Uh, I have a friend that uh, was looking for uh, low ramp housing, and, uh, and he, he was able to get it within a year. Uh, it was Grayson Plaza, and there was uh, uh, another, another uh, tower, uh, one of those tall buildings. And anyway, the uh, uh, the rent was one third of his income. And I know there's some people that don't qualify for some kind of housing. I think that those are those are some people that are really in trouble because uh, uh, then they have to uh, they have to go for regular rent. And the rent is usually more than what uh, house, house payment would be. Uh, so it's hard for them to get, come up with a down payment. Uh, and the, uh, also there's, and in his building, uh, there's, uh, there's like a hearse comes every, about every day. There's somebody dies in that building and, and there's a turnover, uh, turnover of uh, apartments. So a uh, person has to. Okay, our second question is also about housing, and here's the background information. 
Duluth has the oldest housing stock in the state of Minnesota, with 45% of housing in the city over 75 years old, and much of it with deferred maintenance. Duluth also has nearly 40% of all the households living in a rental housing, compared to 27.5% for the state. And 57% of Lincoln Park and Hillside households live in rental housing. The question is, with that in mind, what is the city's responsibility for housing code inspections and balancing competing needs of landlords, tenants, neighbors, and the city? And how could the city's processes be improved? Our first candidate to answer this question will be Richard L. Williams. Um, I believe that uh, the, uh, what we need in the city is uh, more manufacturing, there isn't enough, uh, there isn't enough uh, skilled uh, jobs uh, for young people, and uh, uh, they could afford housing uh, if they had uh, higher pay. Uh, the, um, the problems uh, with rental, I have a rental myself, you know, I, uh, I, I see the, the rents are, uh, the going rents are very high. Uh, it's, uh, it's, that's a big problem, and I, I don't know if there's a solution for it because there's uh, there's a shortage, there's a shortage of uh, rentals, and for somebody looking for a rental, it's uh, difficult. So, uh, and as far as what the city can do about it, uh, uh, I would I would say that uh, increasing the uh, manufacturing, uh, uh, as far as uh, finding manufacturers, uh, would be good because then people would be building. Our next candidate will be Janet Kennedy. Could you repeat? I'm going to open some windows and just would really encourage people, even if you need to stand up to protect your voice, it's getting really hot back here, so we don't want to not hear what you have to say because we're trying to not pass out. Okay. <laughs> okay. So the question is with that, with that in mind, what is the city's responsibility for housing code inspections and balancing competing needs of landlords, tenants, neighbors, and the city? And how could the city's processes be improved? So, you, you know, I, I can't be specific on the code, um, but I can say one of the best ways and best practices is to meet, talk, and find a way. Um, we need to make sure that the people that are in the most need are able to have a safe, reliable place to live. And I understand that sometimes there's competing efforts between the landlords and our laws and ordinances, but if we can come together and have that discussion, I think we can find the best way. I can't be a little more specific as to what I would do or what we could do with that until I'm at the table, and that's why I'm running for city council. And I think the narrative that I come from, being a renter, being a homeowner, and being a mother, and having to pay all those things, and having landlords that sometimes were unhappy because my kids were running or my renters downstairs, but I just believe that we need to have those conversations. And when I'm at the table, I can really talk more about the ordinance or what we need to move things forward. But I believe in meet, talk, and find a way. Thank you. <clears throat> I, I'm just reminded of how important it is. I think experience really matters here. And uh, we have a very uh, young city council in terms of ex council experience. And I think that we really need to keep continuing the momentum that we're going. Specific to your question, um, what should the city do? I think the city should be a lot more aggressive in terms of looking at the rate increases that we continue to see. It's like every time we are looking for additional under rocks in the city, we're looking for additional fees or taxes. And, and one of the hardest hit areas has been for the homeowners. My wife and I have uh, rental units and stuff like that. And it's just appalling how much we have to pay for parking our, our tenants, for, for these inspection fees, while they only have one or two uh, inspectors and whatnot. We should, we should find ways, we should be more creative, uh, not only on the infrastructure, the low interest loans like we used to have back in the early 70s, and I do remember those days, so we can go in and we can, we can upgrade our aged housing stocks and our rental units, make, make life safety a higher uh, priority. Our next candidate will be Tom Furman. 
you know, I hadn't heard Janet's me talk and come to a solution, but that's fantastic. That is one of the great things. Now, I think that just in the same kind of regard, you have to come up with the statistics and the knowledge of what's really happening. And right now in Lincoln Park, as mentioned, they're talking about different things. Did you know that there's only a 3% vacancy rate in rentals right now in Lincoln Park? Now, that is insanely low compared to so many other places in our, in our not, just, not in just Duluth, but in the state itself. Now, we have such a huge number of need going on right now that is not being met. And the problem is very vast and numerous. Now, what we can do is set policies that actually make sure that those rental units are taken care of in the best way possible, meaning that if you're renting a place, it needs to actually be affordable and actually come to terms with what the renter's needs are. Now, we have those ordinances in place, but we need to have, make sure that we have those, those uh, <coughs> The grassroots groups that can actually get together with renters and come to the table in a much more organized fashion to be able to solve the problems with rental units and the, and the landlords. So the, the idea of coming together makes a lot of sense. Our next candidate will be Barb Russ. Uh, thank you. Um, with regard to um, inspections and so on, inspect rentals I think are only inspected every four years um, when they get their license. Um, and there's not a lot more we can do, but uh, tenants certainly can make complaints and they can um, escrow their rent with the court if, they're, um, if uh, there are problems with a rental and they're, they're not getting fixed. There are things that people can do and in fact, just over this last weekend I got a couple of referrals. Apparently there's just been over the week, and I don't know what it has to do with the weather, but a lot of complaints about mold in apartments. And um, surprise, surprise, it's not a code violation to have mold in your rental. And um, that's something I'd like to do, with, and we're going to have to work on legislation, I think, in regard to that. Um, as far as rents, the rent, reason why rents are so high is because we have such a shortage of rentals. And um, a lot of people do... Our next candidate will be Renee Van Um I lived in Lincoln Park for a really long, long, long time. And how I did this, well, I was creative in who I talked to, who my relationships were with the city, with the nonprofits I worked with, with the job I had, to have a job, to make sure I got that down, make sure my kids were secure, public safety was in line, that I could get to the food, that all those things were in line so I could challenge different places like Janet talked about the code inspection stuff I don't I don't know that stuff right now but when I get there boy I'm coming back here and tell you about that but right now I don't have that information because that's not privy to me but I'm super excited to understand about that I want to learn about that stuff so I can help people do what I just did about trying to be safe how my neighbors communicate with each other how we communicate with the city and people like me we don't communicate with the city we don't have that relationship there and that's not okay. I think that should be done better. So I, I think the policies definitely be brought back to the community. People you serve, ask them what they think, bring it back to the city, and let's work on that. That's how I solve problems. Our next candidate will be Zach Filipovich. Boy, this question really, really does hit home with me. Because I grew up working on my dad's rental properties ever since I was 10, pounding nails and painting and uh, improving housing stock here in Duluth. And it's old. You know, we have a lot of old houses in Duluth that have been converted to rentals, um, and we really need to work on that. I have an idea right now. I want to vet it through before I say it publicly um, that might help work with, might help uh, solve that issue. You know, last year we actually uh, hired, or I think it might have been even this year, we hired a, a new housing inspector, added a housing inspector in our city to make those inspections more consistent because I think that is a major key thing. I know when talking with landlords and talking with tenants, I'm a tenant myself, um, having consistent uh, inspections is a uh, major thing to help uh, with uh, balance that out. Um, I am also really, I'm also going to mention the tenant landlord connection I, like I did earlier because that helps balance out the needs of tenants and landlords and there's a lot we can do. Our next candidate will be Brandon Sorbet. <clears throat> living in Morgan Park, I'm living in one of the oldest row homes around, which is about 100, probably 110 years old. 
It also has the world's oldest furnace in there at 103. <laughs> so I, I understand how, you know, renting and buying and trying to talk with your landlord is very important. There also needs to be a kind of uh, set aside number or information that people need to know about so that way they can contact the city in case they have issues that they can't go just between them and their landlord. Also, <clears throat> um, I've rented for the last eight, about eight, 12 years, so knowing who to talk to is very important for me. And also I think having maybe another inspector to help kind of balance everything out in case there is a need for an emergency inspection might also help as well. So to round out the questioning, just you know, recalling at the beginning, 40% of the people living in Duluth are living in rentals. This is this is a, a major issue for the city. This isn't just some issue about we should think about rentals, and that 57%, I believe you said, in Lincoln Park are living are living in rentals. This is a major issue we need to address, and I think having people that have rented in Duluth, like Brandon has talked about, I have rented in Duluth. Um, it's important that we reach out, like Renee said, to people who are living in rental units. Ask the people living in the situations, what can we do to support you? Instead of trying to solve everything on the higher level here of people who live in homes that they own, how much are we reaching out to people living in rentals and asking them what they would like to see the city do? On the flip side of that, we need to go to that high arc of people who own multiple properties, who are making quite a bit of money off of renting um, these higher priced um, charges that, that they're having. And we need to create some incentives for them to bring prices down. What can we do to potentially improve the safety of those homes that could then result in a, in a break? Thanks. We'll now move on to question three. The background for this question is, in addition to loaning out books and media material, the Duluth Public Library provides services such as internet availability, tax filing assistance, support in finding jobs, <coughs> and programs for community members of all ages. In recent years, funding for the library has been flat while costs and usage have grown. Increased funding will be needed to maintain what is already in place, as well as to achieve the number one priority the library identified as urgent for our community, which is to increase early literacy for all of Duluth's children. The question is, please discuss the role of libraries in our community and your placement of funding for libraries among competing needs. The first candidate to answer this question will be Barb Russ. Well, um, there's been a big change in recent years as to what libraries do, and I think that's, that is a good idea. Um, a lot of people don't have access to a, a, a computer on a daily basis, and I think that it's a, it's a safe place for people to go, it's an easy place for, for families to go, and I, I'm very much supportive of all of these different things that they're now doing because they're so important to families. So in terms of uh, the funding of it, um, I think there's a variety of ways we can do it. I'm, I'm not sure specifically what is still available. But I would like to see it funded no matter where we have to look for it. Our next candidate will be Zach Filipovich. Yeah. Wow, this is this is a good question and it's an important one. Um, you know, the I have gotten a lot of emails, actually I think all, all of us counselors have uh, in the past uh, few weeks and months about supporting our public library system. And we have to remember that we have a system in three branches. Um, and they do need to be supportive. When I first got on council, I learned that the computers in all of these libraries, there are lines out the door. And we really need to um, make sure that those areas uh, get upgraded and that we have uh, computers with internet access available for people so they can go and find a job or do research or whatever it is that they want to do. Um, you know, this is why our city budget is the most important thing that the council does because this is how we prioritize our city um, between public safety and libraries. Libraries and parks are some of the most important thing that municipal government does. 
and we really need to make sure that, um, that we are able to have that resource for citizens. Our next candidate will be Janet Kennedy. Mm -hmm. Again, in my head I was reaching for the mic. I was thinking so much. So I grew up in the library. I remember going to the library with my mom and I would carry out stacks of books. And so that hasn't changed, although many kids are not carrying books anymore. They're going there to use the electronics. We have many people in our community who do not have access to electronics and the computer. So I think the library is an important part of what we call a complete community. Um, and our complete communities need to make sure that they have spaces uh, an open space is one of those I call is a library, even though it's in a building. But we need to make sure that's available to all communities. There's good transportation to those communities, or to those buildings, and um, the system for the library. And the way that we can fund that is making sure that we're making it a budget priority. But that's going to have to be based on what the community needs are. We need to go out and make sure the community wants to pay for that in our budget. And so that's how I would move forward with the library. <coughs> And I definitely love the libraries, and so do, so do my grandkids and my mom. Our next candidate will be Renee Van Ness. Um, right. Uh, I used to be a library aide at Red Lake High School, so I have. A, I remember seeing the little kids there coming there, coming there to be safe, coming there to be somewhere that they can escape something that's real, real to us. Um, that's just a memory that came up that I just had to say and talk about. And I know that um, it's important to our kids in this town. It's important to me. My girls actually have library books today. I think that um, it's in managing some nonprofit budgets that I work under, it's about trimming the fat where we can do it and where we can balance things out and being creative and funding options and bring it back to the community again. It's always for me bringing it back to the people and asking folks what they think, how they feel about it, how can we do this better, where can we do this, that, or that, and then working with the council and getting some experience so we can advocate a lot stronger for our education base. So, libraries, huge. Love it. Thank you. Our next candidate will be Brandon Sorbet. Growing up, my favorite weekly activity during the summer was going and getting books at the library. We've been turning it in, me and my wife have been turning it into a monthly endeavor for our children who love it when I read to them. Their current favorite is Chica Chica Boom Boom, which is a funny, funny alphabet book. And like Renee had said, we have to trim the fat on some things that are only for a certain amount of people, certain amount of times of the year. That way we can trade it towards the library where it could use it more year round for everybody to use. Because I know when I was in the cities, I would look for jobs because at the library because I didn't have the internet. Can't afford it, didn't have it. So, went to the library, used the internet, used their resources there, and tried to find jobs. And I think one of the great things about the library was always it was always open, it was always available, and I could always go to it, and that's what I want to do for the people at least. Our next candidate will be Howie Hansen. Thank you. Um, to the issue of uh, the library, uh, you know, who doesn't love the library? Um, you know, and I, I would say that, you know, one of the things that you learn very quickly on the council and how important experience is, is that the process by which the, by, by which the city operates and runs. Our role as a city councilor is to take in information. We meet exhaustively each fall with every department head where they submit their budgets and, and and we need to take a look at that and make sure, ensure that you know that the priorities are set and that the budgets are set so that we can continue to operate very efficiently and move forward as a community in regard to the library well, we're fully funded for what the library is the library in my view it continues to reinvent itself in a technology age and I think we're in a very healthy place uh, the issue that was that was uh, discussed years ago with regard to the infrastructure, I think, will be continuing to be held. But again, it's fully funded. We have a very healthy library system, and I'm proud of our our work to honor that and to uh, commit those dollars that's needed for staffing and other reasons. Our next candidate will be Rich Updegrove. 
I was really happy when looking at Mayor Larson's budget that she's not making any cuts to the library. That's the public library system. That's really important to see that we have someone in our mayor that values libraries. So that's really nice to know that we would, whoever is on this council will be working with someone who, who strongly supports that. My, my family, watch, not my current family, my mom and dad watch movies because they look to see when the library's DVD of the newest release is coming out and they put their request in right away and they sit and wait for it to arrive at the library so they can go get it. My son, Leaf, loves libraries. He gets to have his win at Ordeen in the library and he's elated about that. Um, libraries are central to uh, reaching out to those who are disadvantaged. When you think about summer programs that kids get involved in, they are incredibly expensive, but not at the library. At the library, they're free. You don't have a place to go when it's cold and there's no place for you at the shelter and there's no place that can take you in. The library's doors are open. If you spend time uh, in public places, you'll see how they're used in a variety of ways. Mm -hmm. Our next candidate will be Richard L. Williams. Uh, we have a lot of great organizations in our, our community, like the Lions Club, uh, the American Legion, uh, the Shriners. Uh, uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps what the library might have to do is uh, they might have to look for uh, other sources of funding uh, because it's, uh, they they support a lot of different things like uh, uh, sports and uh, all kinds of activities. So, you know, it may be just a matter of doing some fundraising or talking to these organizations and saying, you know, we need, we need some more money at the library. And uh, they're, they're very generous uh, and they do a lot of fundraising. So it's, uh, that might be one avenue for them. So. Our next candidate will be Tom Furman. Public libraries are a community benefit. There's no doubt about it. And the biggest problem is, is right now, yes, the funding isn't going down, but the bigger issue is, is our use is increasing like crazy because it's a need. We have a lot of people that are utilizing the library because they need to. This is the same kind of a situation where we get, we get to take a pulse of our community, engage how, our, how we're really doing in our needs based upon what the library is doing. And if we start cutting back hours, if we start making them do with what they have without expanding the, abil the ability to give more people access to the Internet, to give more people access to free reading material, this is going to be a bigger problem. And right now, I look at the city situation and say, we cannot not just stop from putting more money into it, but we need to actually increase this because this is our problem. And as a community, we need to realize that this isn't just money that's going to go into a pot that's whatever, we don't take advantage of it. No, this is the people that need to use these things. We can't go away from that. We need to make sure we take care of everyone, and that means making sure we take care of the libraries. Okay, now we will move on to question four. The background for question four is, loss of a grocery store in the Central Hillside and continuing <coughs> lack of access to groceries in the Lincoln Park area affect senior adults, adults with disabilities, low-income residents, and families without transportation. The question is, what is currently being done to assist in viable access to food, and how would you further address the food deserts in our city? Our first candidate to answer this question will be Tom Furman. Thank you, and part of my district is Lincoln Park, fourth district. Lincoln Park is a great, huge food desert. Now, there are two parts to that issue. The first one is making sure that we increase our abilities to have good, solid public transportation. And it doesn't mean for, for people that are able to already walk around and do things. It's also increasing making sure that we have people that have disabilities. Now, one in five people that are in this world are going to have a disability by the time that they die. That's one in five. Look around. You know that we can have more things coming up that we need to make sure we take advantage of and make sure we have good public transportation. Now, the other side of that is making sure that we have good awareness of how to get this food to the right places. Now, this increases if we have money in the area. But again, Lincoln Park does not have that advantage. And I need to make sure that we have a voice at the table fighting for making sure that we have that resource available to our people who need it the most, which is my district, Lincoln Park area. So I'll stop now. Too short a time. Yeah. <coughs> Our next candidate will be Brandon Sorbet. 
Um, well, it's, I haven't really heard much about food deserts, so this is a bit of a first for me. Um, it's <laughs> fortunately that's something I wasn't prepared for, because I haven't really heard much about food shortages. But I think one of the ways that we could probably try to help Lincoln Park is by making it more of a, an incentive for a grocery store to go there, to get in the area, to build and try to make a place where people can get access to it. Uh, maybe even increase like a ride share or possibly a uh, group that will go with you to go get your groceries or go for you in case you are disabled. Because I know I have my one neighbor who has had a bad, a terrible back injury. He can only go once or twice a, a week. So whenever I can, I try to give him a, try to give him a hand. <coughs> Um, the DTA is, has um, been um, partnering with Super One, and it seems to be working out quite well. Um, at first, they just um, outfitted one bus with bins that people could <coughs> use when they go grocery shopping on the bus. And um, as I understand it, that they now are putting bins in all of the buses, and, and so there isn't just one bus that they can use for this. Now, this is a a start for some people um, as a way to get to the grocery store, but we really do need to do more than that. Um, I like a, uh, I, I like the focus that we have right now on uh, community gardens, and I think we need to keep working on that um, throughout the entire city. Um, but we do need to come up with something even better, and that's a you know, grocery store. Our next candidate will be Howie Hansen. Thank you. Uh, this will share with you a little bit about the way I work uh, very quietly behind the scenes and as a businessman I really have worked hard on this issue and uh, I also live a block from Minute Mart in the Lincoln Park District, our district, not my district. Um, I would say that uh, you know this is a huge issue and the, the numbers do not work for anybody to open up a Super One or uh, a smaller, even a smaller grocery store, an, an owner-operated grocery store, it can't, it doesn't work. There's not enough volume there. They can't compete on pricing, so it doesn't work. I've spoken with uh, several Cub Super One's Foods, uh, trying to encourage them to come down there. And the new model out there really is the Quick Trip model. Mm -hmm. And the, the Quick Trip, in as much as they're kind of dominating, you know, that that uh, space. Uh, it really does work pretty well because there's a lot of fresh food there and it's not the best situation, but it clearly, in my view, is a lot better than the traditional 7-Eleven, Minute Mart type things where they're really making a lot of money. Our next candidate will be Janet Kennedy. Thank you. So I'm going to say where you live affects if you can have healthy food or not. And so it, it's much more about transportation. Um, it's much more about economic viability, um, opportunities, and access. And so I've been doing a lot of work again with the Planning Commission and the Health and All Policies in moving forward to make sure that we have opportunities and access for all people in all neighborhoods. That's what we need to do. We need to be comprehensive about that and not just think about a grocery store. Um, because where are you putting that grocery store? Where are we setting our zoning for that grocery store? We need to make sure we have access to food for everyone. That includes our transportation. Where are we putting that transportation? And the bus is nice, the grocery bus is nice, but it's still not casting a wide enough net. There are still people having life expectancy differences in our neighborhoods, and it's not just Lincoln Park. And we need to be real about that and have conversations with everybody at the <coughs> table, especially people who are experiencing those um, inequities. Our next candidate will be Renee Van Nett. Right. Thank you. I, um, I live right in that, before I moved to Hill, right in the heart of people not having access to get food at all and part of that issue too is other issues like having employment having a way to to do that it's having making sure they're safe to be able to go out and do these things get employment get all that and then just to top that off i've already had conversations about the grocery store the things of how we were talking about 
Yeah, I've had conversations with people. Uh, there's a grocery store that used to be on 3rd and 29th West that I think I want to do something with that. And I know it sounds impossible, but I don't care. That's just too bad. I need to figure out something else that we can do to get something done to combat some of these issues where people don't have to go to these little stores and get food and spend all their food stamps, spend all their money, spend all these things that could kill their heart. That stuff Janet talked about where we can't live this life expectancy because we have to eat this stuff. No, not okay. Um, we were canvassed by Fair Food Access and different people with the bus. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Next candidate will be Zach Filipovich. Yeah, well, you can't live a healthy lifestyle if, you're, if you don't have access to good food and healthy food. That is extremely clear. When you, when you ride the bus out in um, Lincoln Park all the way out to um, Morgan Park and Gary New Duluth and Fond du Lac, you see people bringing groceries from Spirit Valley all the way out to those areas on the bus. And they can, you can only carry so much in plastic bags before it starts to hurt your hand. Um, Barr mentioned the, uh, the the DTA bus program. That is a fantastic program. They're um, they're tweaking some of it to make it even better, which I'm very very um, proud and glad about. Um, you know, this is an economic equity issue. It's just it's more than just food. It's about uh, economics. It's about health. Um, you know, the Fair Food Access uh, organization has been promoting more farmers markets, which uh, which I think is a fantastic way to go. My mom sells. Um, fresh blueberries at farmers markets as a way to, um, you know, help, help in that effort. Our next candidate will be Rich Updegrove. <clears throat> Part of what we're talking about is right out the window here at the 4th Street Market and the importance that a local store can have in a neighborhood and in a community and when that's gone, how does that impact and who does it impact and to what extent. I used to work out of this building long ago um, when it was when I was working for Youth Employment Services Duluth, yes Duluth, uh, that worked with uh, underprivileged children and we went to that store <laughs> quite often and so do many in the neighborhood and when those disappear it's uh, a travesty. Transportation has been addressed really well and that is one way to really try to, to improve that and increasing the number of routes that the bus can take and all of those things. Also, you know, no one had mentioned, but I thought it was really great to see that uh, the co-op opened the Denfeld store. I think that's a great you know, move in, in, in the right direction. Just recently sitting in the car talking with my kids, we had a soccer game and I was coaching my daughter's soccer team and we got all these treats and they were really lousy treats in terms of like they were horrible for you. But we talked about, well, that family brought them because they were really cheap. And that's what we've created, is cheap, awful food instead of good, affordable food. Mm -hmm. Our next candidate will be Richard L. Williams. Um, I think Court Corrupt has uh, got a great business uh, model. Uh, they, they're very uh, reasonable on your basic things like eggs, bread, milk. Uh, and I know my uh, stepdaughter really appreciates uh, going, you know, having a quick trip in her neighborhood. As far as the uh, DTA and their uh, grocery run, I'm not sure they go to the uh, Lincoln Park area, but uh, mm -hmm. I think that uh, they could be talked into uh, maybe extending that uh, into, uh, uh, you know, maybe a bigger loop. Mm -hmm. But it kind of goes in a loop, and uh, mm -hmm. I, I think it's I think it's a good thing. But the quick trip, uh, you know, there's almost there's so many of them you can almost walk to a quick trip from your house. I mean, there's like 30 of them, 30 new ones. And, uh, but they have a uh, they uh, they have their own dairy, they have their own uh, bakery and every uh, all these things, uh, and uh, and they uh, and they, and they uh, promote their business through uh, you know these basics. We will now move on to question five. The background is the state <coughs> legislature passed a law which prohibits cities from banning plastic bags. The question is, would you be supportive of placing a fee on all bags so as to encourage use of reusable bags and support reduction of plastic <coughs> in Lake Superior, landfills, etc.? The candidate to answer first will be Renee Van Nett. Yeah, um hard one for people who can't afford it. Difficult. Difficult there. I think in general I would definitely think about think about it. I 
I just can't get away from people that can't afford for how much it's going to cost every bag they can barely afford to get to food to get to the store to get it home. That's it's, it's a barrier that way. Um, so I would look at that a little bit more and talk about a little bit more people that I work with because I just it feels uncomfortable a little bit and I want to be creative about how we do that in this town. So that's kind of how I feel about that. I, it's a little sticky for me. Thank you. Our next candidate is Richard L. Williams. Um, I think the co-op uh, definitely. I think you have to bring your own containers. Don't you? Uh, I'm not sure. But. I believe you have to bring your own containers there. Uh, that's one solution. I, I don't know if the Super One would ever do that. Uh, they would, uh, you know, that, that would be a solution to uh, not having all the bags in the, in the landfill. Uh, there could be like uh, maybe uh, an ordinance or something that could be uh, maybe uh, push these uh, grocery places to uh, reduce the number of bags. Our next candidate is Rich Uptergrove. So while, while the Whole Foods Co-op doesn't uh, require you to bring their, your own container, they, they do not offer plastic bags, which is a, a choice that, they, that they've made. And you can donate, you know, five cents or whatnot if you bring in your own bag and, and, that, and that sort of thing. And that's one way to go, and it's changing the culture. And it's, you know, can we find grants to provide reusable bags that can be handed out at a variety of places? If we were to phase out plastic bags, can we have some of them taken to places <coughs> like the Damiano Center and um, homeless shelters where they can be used in a variety of really innovative ways of keeping your materials safe from the rain and, and that sort of thing. There are, there are ways to go about it. This strikes to a bigger issue, and that's that we have down in St. Paul a, a group of legislators that want to take away the ability for cities to pass ordinances and, to, and then to enforce them to make their communities better. And when St. Paul is saying that you can't do that, well, we can push against that. We, we can work to say that we want to change this community and stand up for the way that we want our life to be. We live on this great lake, and there's a way to protect that lake. And one of, and one of those ways is to stand up to what I would call corporate interference. Our next candidate will be Tom Furman. Uh, if you're not familiar with the, the work that's been going on, it's called Baguette Duluth, and it's fantastic. I've sat in a number of the informative sessions and I've talked with some of the organizers, and I can tell you right now from a personal standpoint, I love it. If I'm a city councilor, there's other things that go on to it that are much more involved. They're making sure that we do have that access to making sure they have, everyone has abilities to be able to afford everything. They've talked about this. They've actually covered this issue. They've said people that are on WIC, on food stamps, on other different, other different support needs, they're going to be taken away from that situation and said, you don't have to pay for your bags. Now, I do like the idea of making sure that we change our culture, though. And I think that the model, that when we look at Whole Foods Co-op and what they're saying, if you bring your own bag in, we're letting you donate five cents for every bag that you use to the group that's actually ho ho hosting the, the, the newest um, uh, food bank, food shelf. Now, these are fantastic ways to go. But before I, could, before I could say, yes, I'm all behind it, I had to do my homework. So now I'm all for it. <laughs> Well, I didn't realize that that went through at the legislature, but um, with regard to the plastic bags, um, I, I, have a, I have a car, a backseat of a car that are a bunch of, um, not plastic bags, but um, <coughs> cloth bags, you know, I reuse them. My, I just can't seem to train myself to take, take them in all the time. So, um, but, um, so I'd like to you know, get rid of the plastic bag, you know, those one trying to get a super one or whatever too, um, because they are da they're dangerous to birds who end up, <coughs> end up with them around their neck and that sort of thing. And it's just, um, I think it's just something we need to do. And I'm not sure what what we how we are going to do it if indeed that legislation did pass in the legislature. But we got to do something. <coughs> Our next candidate will be Janet Kennedy. Yes, I believe that the more local solutions that we have, the better our policies are for everyone. You know, I did go to the Baggett movie, and after seeing that, it took me back to when I was in fifth grade, and I remember we had this discussion about bags and how that, you know, 20, 30, 40 years from now, we're going to be having to deal with that. 
And now we are having to deal with that. And we have fish that are not eating plankton, they're eating plastic. And so we need to be real about how we're affecting our environment. And I believe that having this conversation about Bagot is a good way to move forward. Now I also understand that it could have an unintentional consequences for people living in poverty and even working people. Because depending on how much that bag is, five cents is five cents and that hits you right in the pocketbook. So as a city councilor, I want to make sure, again, we're going to meet, talk, and find a way that it's going to work for everyone. But I believe in saving our environment. Our next, or next candidate will be Holly Hansen. Thank you. As uh, Barb, Zach, and myself, and former councilors Gary Eckenberg and, mm -hmm. uh, and Sharla Gardner, who are in the audience, uh, know, uh, you know, when you're sitting in 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 front of a large audience, often in a in a televised uh, thing at the with the pact and whatnot, you have to make decisions a lot of times on the fly. You're not provided ample opportunities sometimes, and there's a, a myriad of different resolutions and ordinances that come our way. And specific to this ordinance, um, I I really believe that uh, that this is taps into something I'm really bullish against, and that's increasing taxes and fees. And I'm very proud that I'm in the minority, of course, but I'm very proud of the fact that the people in my district know where I stand. And that's, I'm not going to support any increase in fees, and I'm not going to increase taxes. And I think that minority position <coughs> needs to continue to be said and held on this Duluth City Council. And it's not popular, but it takes courage and good leadership to be in that position. Well, me and my wife have stopped using plastic bags for the last four years, so I actually completely forgot about the fact that there are so many in use. We've actually gone to reusable bags that my wife has purchased here and there, and, and you know, I've just learned how to play really, really good games of Tetris with them. So, um, I'm actually a little bit against fines and fees for <coughs> people to use plastic bags. I mean, it's up, really up to the people and trying to re-educate our children and our people who are using them to get, you know, renewable bags or reusable bags or just kind of skip the plastic, even though it's a lot easier sometimes for some people. But, like I said, just re-education sometimes is all we need. Boy, it's, uh, when you're in the habit of doing something every day, it's hard to break that habit. Um, and, you know, I, I just mentioned the last question about people bringing plastic bags on the bus and, and hurting their hands. You know, I, I really try to use my reason, reusable bag whenever I can when I go to the grocery store. I actually lived um, in another city. I had an internship um, where you did have to pay a five cent fee to get a plastic bag. And boy, I reused that plastic bag and got my money's worth out of that nickel. Um, but you know, in in Duluth, I am concerned about the affordability piece. I am concerned um, about uh, uh, obviously our lake and the pollution that plastic bags create. Um, I want to explore this. I think uh, you know maybe it might be a combination of a lot of different things, but a fee or maybe an incentive like what the co-op does or deposit when, when you, uh, you know, reuse a bag or something like that. I know other communities have figured this out and we can too. <clears throat> we'll now move on to question six. The background for this question is, the Duluth City Council has weighed in on issues outside the purview of city government. For example, shootings at the nightclub in Orlando. The question is, how should the City Council balance its role and time around issues over which they have governmental jurisdiction versus issues where the Council or the City may want to take a stand, but where they have no jurisdiction? The first candidate to answer this question will be Zach Filipovich. Have fun with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, this, uh, there's, there's, there's been uh, some feedback in, in recent years on, on this issue. Um, and, 
you know, the, the, the shooting, the, the example, the shooting, the, the resolution in support of those in Orlando, you know, these are, these are important issues for, for the, the country and, and for all of us. And we need to, I think it's good for the council to recognize the importance of these, of these issues. Um, four years ago when I ran, um, I said that I'm not going to sponsor resolutions that um, I feel are outside of Duluth's purview or jurisdiction. Um, but you know, as a counselor, when when they're brought up, we we vote on them, and I try to make uh, my best determination um, on these issues with the facts that I have. And um, you know, there's a lot of a lot of these can be uh, very impassioned, and they are important issues. But uh, I do want to focus on uh, things pertaining to. to our next candidate will be Tom Furman. Duluth has a great history of actually supporting a lot of the progressive issues going on, not just within their area, but outside of their area. I believe that you can, if you can't walk and chew gum as a city councilor, you're probably not looking for the right job. Now really, you can do both, making sure that we maintain what we have here in Duluth and being sure that our voice is heard in other areas. Because these are not just, we don't live in a bubble situation. We actually affect a lot of other areas. We can give our two cents worth. And in a lot of places, our two cents worth is worth more than just two cents. So I want to make sure that if I'm on the city council, I will make sure that we do support things, such as making sure that we support and stand up for the water, the water rights. We're making sure that we do stand up and make sure that we do have DNR's feedback on getting a policy for polymets right to mine. We need to make sure that we put these out there. As Duluth citizens, that's what I would want my city councilors to do. So I would do that for you as well. Our next candidate will be Richard L. Williams. Um, I don't, I'm not against uh, bringing up issues that are outside the area. Um, you're, uh, you're, talking about, uh, you're talking about Lake Superior area and all. If there's something happening in another part of Lake Superior, it's going to affect us. Uh, everybody could vote uh, up or down whether they want to uh, include it. And if there's more downs in there or ups, then then uh, then the statement shouldn't be made. Uh, you know that's the way the council is. So uh, you have your you have your own conscience uh, to vote however you want, and uh, and uh, it's not always going to come out. Uh, exactly like everybody wants. Our next candidate will be Janet Kennedy. Can you repeat the question? And let me know, am I hollering? Because I'm just trying to be loud enough. You're good. Okay. I think you're loud enough. The question is, how should the city council balance its role and time around issues over which they have governmental jurisdiction versus issues where the council or the city may want to take a stand, but where they have no jurisdiction? Well, if I'm elected as an at-large city councilor, my priority would be for the community members. And, and although I have the values and carry the, you know, the, the you know, health equity, social justice, human rights, community resilience, and sustainability as my platform, I am going to be a counselor for what the community wants. And what that means is I'm going to be out there listening and making sure that what is of importance, whether it's locally, at the state level, or at the federal level, that that's what the community wants to talk about. I also know that we are seen as leaders in the community, so sometimes we need to take that role and be the leads in some of those conversations. And so I believe that I'm already doing that and getting out in the community, listening to the voices of the people are one of the most important things we can do, whether it's local, state, or at the federal level. But, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Our next candidate will be Renee Van Nett. Um, thank you. My, the way I think about this question is about keeping our center focused, keeping our business together doing our work for ourselves first and making sure that our constituents are on board with that, bring it back to the community, get their voice heard, and uh, make sure that we have a strong core so that when other people do look down and in on us and ask see what we're doing, they see that we have it together first. When I was out in D.C. talking about water issues and lobbying out there for water, they, 
Ellison, Keith Ellison said that we have the bluest part of the state in Duluth, and I was super proud of that. I just couldn't be more prouder of how people look at us in that level. In addition to that, I have a relationship with the county commissioner in Beltrami County, and they watch what we're doing because the work that we're so core focused on our issues that it makes them want to be more stronger in who they are. And so that made me feel really happy about making sure that we stick to our guns and make sure we keep ourselves on track and moving forward. Thank you. Our next candidate will be Rich Updegrove. I want to make sure that a question like this isn't misconstrued to think that uh, Duluth doesn't have jurisdiction over what happens to the waters of Lake Superior, what happens to our clean drinking water that wins international awards. Uh, that shouldn't even be addressed. This is not about uh, an issue of polymet. We have every right to take a stand for our water. But this is about maybe the pipeline vote. When you have an Indigenous Peoples Commission of the city put together a resolution and that is presented in five different voices or more to the council and then the, the council hears that and has testimony and recognizes that a stance for the Indigenous people of Duluth is within their jurisdiction to take that stance and that it's a broader issue, that it's a threat to a lot of things. You're talking about tar sands going through this pipeline. That alone is a reason to take a stance against it, let alone going through Indigenous land that is a, a nation does, is not asking for it. That's a, a reason to stand for it. And the same with the Orlando shooting. You need to send a message to vulnerable populations to say the LGBTQ plus community in Duluth should not feel threatened and know the city council is with them. Our next candidate will be Brandon Sorbet. I do agree with some things that Rich has said, like people who are in the LGBTQ community should never be afraid. That is something that anybody should never be afraid of somebody else. But please, things like polymet, where they have gone through rigorous testing, questions, different other multiple agencies going through every single thing and getting there okay, I think that we should be out of there. Because we are an export town. We are a port town. This is how we make our, some of our money, is by shipping off these products that get pulled from their iron range, brought to us, and out to the world. And <coughs> things, these issues that have all these rigorous testing, retesting, and all these impact statements that have passed through everything is not part of, I don't feel, as much through our jurisdiction as some people think. Our next candidate will be Howard Hansen. Thank you. Um, I stood with Standing Rock and uh, I'm really proud of that today and the reason I'm proud of it is it's, it's not about the environment, it's not about the strong lobby that certainly was applied to the, to the City Council, but I was proud because the people of my district said, Howie, you represent us as a, your elect, our elected official and you stand behind Standing Rock and I did and I'm proud of that. Also at the same time, I'm still the same kind of person that is saying I'm going to fight my hardest to make sure that people are not being taxed and feed out of their homes. The people in my district are saying, be strong, you know, even if you're in that minority, you be strong and you make sure that every dollar that the government is trying to take away from us, that you fight for us, that you be a strong voice because we're making strong choices between food and proper health care. And a lot of people are living on fixed incomes in, in my district. And they, they need experience. They need a counselor who's willing to stand up, not be a rubber stamp, and will say strongly that no more taxes and fees. Let's get back to the basics. Okay. Our next candidate will be Barb Russ. With regard to this, I think the problem we have is we don't always agree on what is or isn't within our jurisdiction. <clears throat> and so, for example, what um, a lot of people were angry with me about had to do with a, pro a process, not actually the, the polymer thing. <clears throat> and and I, my, re my reasoning for voting against that particular um, resolution because it, I felt that it was not, the timing was wrong and it was premature. And so, and um, and and one thing I think when when we disagree on some things, I think it's really important for all of us to do our best to not turn on people over because you have a disagreement over one thing. 
And so for, I expect uh, evidentiary hearings. I would expect there must be some coming up very soon over the dam. For, and, and I think they've got to have those hearings. There's no question about it. So I'm not opposed to it, but we, we are not always going to agree on what is within our jurisdiction and what isn't. That's what I think is going to be the problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, we will now move on to question seven. The background is, the city has been studying the issue of earned sick and safe time. The question is, what is the role of the city and the city council in establishing earned sick and safe time? The first candidate to answer this question will be Janet Kennedy. So currently we have a task force for the, or the, the city has a task force for the earned sick and safe time. Um, I believe that's the same vetting process that they use with any sort of ordinance and definitely been being used in the comprehensive plan is when we're going out and we're talking to the community and asking the community what they want. And that includes all stakeholders on both sides of the conversation, people that are in support of it and people that are not in support of it. And so as a city councilor, it would be my role to make sure I'm listening to that and vetting all of those conversations and voting according to what I'm hearing. I'm going to be the city councilor that's going to also go out there, even after all these evident, all these hearings, I'm still going to be out there asking people what they want me to do and how they would like me to vote. Now, I know earned sick and safe time affects working individuals. I was a single mom and worked and did not have earned sick and safe time. So I understand that I know that it's important that people aren't going to work sick and that I, they're not sending their children to school sick. And so we need to make sure we do have that here in our city. Our next candidate will be Renee Van Nett. As for Earth Sick and Safe Time for sure, I wouldn't be able to live without it in the job I have. I'm an employment navigator and I help people every single day get a job. And I make, want to make sure for them that they can be home with their kids, that they can have the opportunities I have or how fair is that. I think how as a counselor that I want to make sure what we do, our role in that, is to make sure that it's in place and that we hold our <clears throat> we hold our community members down down meaning support and that we can support the decisions that they make to have time off for their kids, how safe they are, what happens to them, different those different types of things. So I think as a counselor supporting that and then pushing forward to a stronger resolution on how we do that together and with the community's response. Our next candidate will be Tom Furman. When it came to earn sick and safe time, I sat on a number of the different listening sessions and I heard a number of other people talk and I had to talk as well because this was an issue that really makes sense. I learned a lot more about it than I ever expected to. 46% of our working neighbors do not receive earned sick and safe time right now. This is a huge problem. Now, yes, people will work no matter what the situation because they just have to work to make a living. <clears throat> However, should they be subjected to whatever kind of wages and whatever issues happen? No. We as a community can work better. And this situation of saying earned sick and safe time should be an ordinance and mandatory, I believe that that is necessary because we've had voluntary process the whole time. Voluntarily, the businesses are holding it up up to 46% failure. This cannot happen in our communities. We need to make sure we take care of everyone. And that starts by making sure that we have an earned sick and safe time. I've listened to the situation. I've listened to businessmen. But however, that earned sick and safe time at a $10 an hour wage, oh, I wish I could get in the numbers right now, but I've got to stop. Mm -hmm. Our next candidate will be Rich Updegrove. I think Tom usually says like 30 cents or something like that an hour. Um, <laughs> Thank you. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> the, issue, the issue of earned sick and safe time is a, is a public safety issue, a public health issue. Uh, it's workplace safety. It's not a benefit that you earn a, 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 as a worker. This is, this is about keeping our people safe. This is making life better for the vast majority of people in Duluth. When you recognize that people who don't have earned sick and safe time are giving you your food and they are coming to work sick, and now you are getting sick because the owner of that business is deciding to make a little more of a profit as opposed to letting that worker bank one hour 
for every 30 hours that they've worked to use only for earn sick and save time, then you see where the, where the problem is. Earn sick and save time is an essential way to help a vast majority of, of the people in Duluth. And it'll actually improve the productivity of the workers, the mental health of the workers. This is good for business and this is good for the workers and that's why I would support a full and enforceable earn sick and save time. I'm in favor of uh, the earned uh, sick time and sick time. Uh, I believe that, uh, you know, uh, we as uh, customers uh, of uh, whatever companies are offering it, we're going to pay for it, and I don't mind paying for it. I don't mind, I don't mind fishing out more money if, uh, if it's going to do something like that. I'm all, all for it because there, I mean, most of the jobs I've had, uh, were uh, union jobs and so on, and I had I had earned uh, sick time. I had, was a teacher at Lake Superior College. I had nine sick days and I had three personal leave days. And uh, you know, I, I really appreciated having that. Uh, I didn't use them, and I got paid for them when I retired. But uh, I used some of them. But, uh, so I, I'm all for it, uh, uh, but. We, we just have to understand that it's going to be paid for by the customers. Our next candidate will be Zach Filipovich. This is an important issue to me. I think about my mom <coughs> when she was a single mother in Minneapolis and St. Paul, caring for my brother. She had the opportunity to um, have family members look after him. When, my, when I was born, my dad was working on the railroad. For days at a time, I was able to be cared for by my grandparents here in town. Not everybody has those opportunities. We need earned sick and safe time here in Duluth. You know, and I think this is not just a health issue, it's an economic equity issue. We need to make sure that, uh, you know, the 22% of our neighbors who live below the poverty line have the opportunity to get better or get to a safe situation um, when they need to. Uh, and that's why I brought together the task force to look at a Duluth specific solution for this problem. Uh, we already know uh, the problem exists. We need to make it work for everyone um, in our city because no one should have to choose between getting better and getting a paycheck. Thank you. Our next candidate will be Barb Russ. Well, I'm a very strong supporter of a full sick and safe time ordinance. And um, when I, I've always had that kind of um, benefit from the time I was in college, of course you don't need it. And then uh, in law school I worked for the state of Minnesota as a state planner and I had that benefit. And uh, when ever, you know, working for St. Louis County I had wonderful benefits, sick leave, personal leave time, vacation time, and it never occurred to me that everyone didn't have that kind of benefit. And this is so important for our families. Um, it, it, you know, families need to be able to take care of each other when necessary. Um, they don't always have grandparents or other uh, people who can care for their children. And so it's, it, it just is common sense to me. Um, you know, you mentioned, you know, having servers working sick and, you know, either preparing your food or serving you your food, and uh, nobody wants that. So I'm a very strong supporter of it. I'm looking forward to seeing what the um, we have to choose from. Our next candidate will be Howie Hansen. I'm for voluntary uh, earned safe and sick time. I'm also concerned also what's coming down the pike and mark this down in pen today that within two weeks after the election in November you're going to see the $15 an hour wage increase uh, being discussed at the council and voted on before the end of the year. My concern about the $15 an hour thing is it's a jobs and a rent increase killer in a sense. Rents will go up in Duluth as a result of $15 an hour. We will have a larger middle class. More people will be put out of work. Businesses will begin to close. Restaurants, for example, will get much more expensive. And uh, rents will go up big time. Seventy percent, as I've heard today, seventy percent of the people in our district, in the Lincoln Park District, uh, are renters. 
the rents are going up 50 to 100 bucks a month after the first year. Those costs at the restaurant levels and the, and the housing levels will all be passed on to the people. Think about it. Our next candidate will be Brandon Sorbet. I'm also for a voluntary one. Being in the Twin Cities for many years, uh, working, trying to start raising a family, I had a lot of just temporary jobs where if I didn't work, I didn't get paid. And if I didn't get paid, we didn't get our bills paid, we didn't have food on our table. So yes, I did work sick a lot. My wife, luckily, she worked for U.S. Bank during that time and had many years there, so she had a lot of earned time for in case of our child being sick or when he had to have heart surgery. So, yes, she had it earned. So I am for a voluntary, maybe even try to make a little bit more of an incentive for businesses to try to get that earned faster. But I also am afraid of the $15 an hour wage increase. That's going to be a jobs killer. It's going to make our middle class shrink. We're going to have more and more people under on the poverty line or on welfare. So, I'm done. We will now move on to our part of the forum where we ask audience questions. And in hopes that we can try to squeeze in as many as possible, we will right now do a lightning round. So, <laughs> what we'll do... Can we have the water pitcher test? <laughs> yes, yeah. uh, water <laughs> Thanks. You have 15 seconds to answer this question. <laughs> yes, no, Thank you yes, no, yes, no. Oh, it's going to be a one word. <coughs> one word answer. I'm going to think of some good ones. Zap. <laughs> Zing. One word answer coming up. Ow. Do the Batman noises. <laughs> yeah, yes or no. Yes or no. Yeah. Oh, it's not going to make it. Yeah. They got one coming. I always do. Oh, Zach has a oh, oh, he's got his own bottom. Thank you. Thank you. Pack it up there. This is lightning round. This is lightning round. What is the lightning round? What is the lightning round? So what we're going to do for the lightning round is I'm going to ask a question and this response will be yes or no. And we're going to start the first question at Zach Filipovich and we'll just go down the line and you just say yes or no. And then the second question will start here at Richard and we'll go down the line yes or no. And then the third question, you'll just have to name a name. So you're just naming a name, and then you, that's it. Okay? So the first question is going to be, would you support an ordinance to make Duluth a $15 per hour minimum wage city? Yes or no? Go. Uh, well, I, 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 have a, I have a question about the, the question. Okay. Is there, like, is there a time frame involved, or... No. Would you support an ordinance to make yes. 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 To say Duluth is downstream and we oppose copper sulfide mining near Lake Superior and its watershed. Go. Yes. Yes. I'm sorry, what was the question? Would you support a resolution to say Duluth is downstream and we oppose copper, sulf copper sulfide mining near Lake Superior and its watershed? No. No. Yes. No. Heck yes. No. All right. 
So this question, I just want you to just name a name for your answer, and we'll start with Zach. Who is your political inspiration? <laughs> wow. Uh, my grandmother, Pearl Fulton. That's a good one. <laughs> for me, because I was, oh, I'm sorry, Jimmy Carter. Hubert Humphrey, who I spent summers with. And <laughs> I'm going to say Michelle Obama, but underneath Mom, Annie. <laughs> Walter Mondale. Uh, Reagan. Paul Wilson. Paul Wilson. Uh, Reagan. All right. Now we'll end the lightning round, and cool. we will have a couple more questions, and each candidate will have one minute to respond. <laughs> All right. This question is, recently a report indicated that Minnesota is the second most unequal state in the nation in terms of economic and housing disparities. For example, the medium income for whites is two times the income for people of color. How would you address the barriers to economic opportunities and success? The first candidate to answer this question will be Howie Hansen. Well, um, I'll just mention a, a discussion I had from a, uh, an employer in Duluth uh, who I won't identify, but uh, who employs upwards of 900 people. And it was interesting to talk to him, and he was talking about how he was trying to fill all of his vacancies at his businesses and stuff like that, and he was having a hard time finding people. So I really believe that anybody who wants to work can find a job in the city of Lilith. And, and while it might not be a great paying job, nevertheless is a job. And uh, so are there disparities? No question. You know, can we do better as a city? Absolutely. But, you know, it's st we're still people. We still make choices. And, you know, I'm concerned that we're moving as a community to more social welfare type uh, thinking and acceptance than giving people the self-dignity of holding a job, uh, earning the money to purchase their own homes. And I'd like to move us, continue to move us forward in those directions. Well, it can be kind of complicated, and I'm, I'm, I understand that these disparities have existed for some time. Um, I think it starts in the schools, and um, I'm very um, encouraged that the Carpenters Union, for example, is um, very interested in working with parents in the middle schools and teaching families about the jobs that are possible for students, not just students of color, but, but for all students, and I think we, that's one thing that can be helpful towards the future. Um, there's, in terms of um, jobs, I think right now I think we have a, a very robust um, um, Human Rights Commission, and I think that um, there's some work that they can do um, with regard to some, you know, working on some of these things, and I look, I look forward to that. Uh, I think we have to do look at a variety of ways to deal with this. It's, it's, it's an old problem, and we, we need to do something. The next candidate will be Renee Van Nett. <clears throat> um, I work on this every single day as an employment navigator, and I, with Community Action to look at, in Lincoln Park, I work with MFIP <laughs> participants who don't, who don't have the skills right now to get a job or to know how to keep a job, or however that works, or in the education to do that. So we, I've helped partner them with other organizations that can help them move through MPEP and get, get on to get a house, buy every single thing they, they want through education. Um, I think doing that with my partners that I work with and the council members, I think educating each other on the realness of that so that we can all go at it and attack it and work on it better. Attack's a bad word, sorry. But to work on it better. Um, so it's very real for me every day. And I've lived through it and done it myself. And I can teach other people how to do it. And I'd be more than willing to help people understand how to do this and move forward and move ahead. Thank you. Our next candidate will be Jeff Hansen. 
Anita will be Tom Kermit. Now, <clears throat> I realize how he talks about the fear of socialism, the, of the fear of the idea of what we're going to actually have. Did you know that more than half of us in, the, in our nation isn't afraid of the idea of having universal health care? That's awesome. We're not afraid about it. He's been saying, we should have K through college public education. This is the way that we should be looking at things, not the fearing of the idea of going forward. This is progress. This is what it means to be progressive. It means going forward. It means taking the bull by the horns and making the changes right for our society. We shouldn't be fearing this. We should be embracing it. We shouldn't run away from this challenge because it's going to happen. You can either embrace it and love it or get run over it because right now our community is changing. We need this kind of a situation to make that economic disparity start disappearing. It starts with those ounces of prevention. It starts with earn sick and safe. It starts with making sure we take care of one another. So that's where I would be, and that does separate us. The next candidate is Brandon Sorbet. Well, I agree with Howie on. If you want a job, you will get that, get a job. I have had to do it so many times. I've had so many different types of positions. I have worked some of the most disgusting things you could ever view. But I have done it because I needed that job. And anybody who has that mentality can get the job. And trying to say that it's all about education, it's not. Most of it is about attitude. I don't even have a college education. I'm a high school, graduated after I should have, non-college educated. I have learned more out on my job sites that I have worked with a variety of people from different walks of life, I guess different skin color if you really want to look at it that way. But it's all been down to attitude. If I can learn it, I can do it if you are willing to teach me and I want to try to get away from more of a welfare state because I have fear that that's where we're headed. Our next candidate will be Rich Uftergrove. <clears throat> Addressing those inequities is a lot of what Brandon is talking about. He graduated from high school, and because of that, his life is better than it would have been if he hadn't, right? And graduating from high school is something that is uh, something we're struggling with as a city. We have one of the lowest graduation rates of African-American students in um, the country. That, that's something we need to partner with the school district with. That's something that we need to recognize is rooted in deep issues, issues of affordable housing, which we've talked about, issues of um, a, a strong <clears throat> worker system where you have earned sick and safe time, which we've talked about. It is access to nutritional food, which we've talked about. We need a safety net. We need a system that lifts up all people. Public libraries, these are all things that we do. <clears throat> Education is the path to a better life. And I feel that I'm positioned well to do that as a teacher, as someone who's worked with you throughout my life. If we want generational change, it starts young, and you work through, and life gets better generation after generation, increasing college graduation if possible, and definitely high school. Our next candidate will be Richard L. Williams. Uh, I don't know if you've seen a recent uh, a recent article about uh, they showed all the different schools our area or whatever and how they perform and everything. Uh, that totally reflects what, what the question was about. Uh, and uh, ESCO was the top one. They were better than the East High School. Uh, you, and uh, if you know about the uh, diversity in ESCO, they're either Norwegian or, or Finlander. <laughs> uh, so, you know, it's not... Uh, that's why ESCO was doing so well, I think. They, they, didn't, have, they didn't have the diversity they had now in some of these other schools. The problem has to be somewhere uh, besides just, uh, you know, who's, uh, who's applying for the job. It's, it's got to be somewhere down in the school, uh, self-image, uh, all kinds of things. So there's, there's a lot of other things. It's very complicated. Mm -hmm. Our next candidate will be Janet Kennedy. Can you read that question again? I feel like I have a lot of answers on maybe not. <coughs> anybody answer me? <laughs> Sorry. No. I'm happy to reread it. Recently, a report indicated that Minnesota is the second most unequal state in terms of economic and housing disparities. For example, the median income for whites is two times the income for people of color. 
how would you address the barriers to economic opportunities and success? So as I stated before, I've done a lot of work around this with the health and all policies and being on the planning commission and, and we're updating our comprehensive plan. But I'm going to say with this subject, experience matters. We've heard a couple of times from some of the other counselors that are sitting that experience matters. And in this case, it does. Because we need to meet the people that are experiencing the inequities where they're at and make sure we're making that a priority. Because we are only as strong as our weakest link here in Duluth. And those of us who can, should. And we need to make sure that we are making policies that work for everyone. Every time you make a decision on the city council, it's a social issue. So I'm not sure and not sure if I can understand why we don't want to make sure we're moving toward those social, social issues of inequities. Because it's up to us and it's our job as city councilors to make sure everyone in Duluth is doing well here. And that includes housing, economic development, transportation, our open space space, and our environment. So let's get together and be more inclusive at that table and make a difference. Our next candidate is Zach Filipovich. Yeah, thank you. Well, I, as I mentioned before, I'm an accountant and I do um, payrolls. And I see people who cannot afford to save for their own retirement because they have to use all their paycheck to meet their living needs right now. We, Janet mentioned in her opening statement, based on which neighborhood you live in, there's 11 year life expectancy difference in our city. It is horrifying. Um, that is why earnings and safe time is so important. That is why living wage jobs here in Duluth are so important. Before I was an accountant, I had some experience in economic development. We can do this. I was, I'm on the Duluth Economic Development Authority now as the secretary, and my first year as council, I was on the 1200 fund, granting low interest loans to small businesses so they can hire new people, local businesses hiring more people. That is how we're going to sustainably grow our economy in an equitable way. We have one more question, but limited time. So I think we will start with Richard and one sentence go down the line. <coughs> how many the commas? Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Can you repeat that? One reasonable <laughs> sentence. What do you believe is the most pressing issue facing our city today? Uh, the uh, manufacturing uh, inequity uh, with the, 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 the manufacturing, uh, so how do you judge? Pressing. Uh, employment, issue, employment opportunities for all so that everybody can get, get on the same wavelength and be able to afford their, their lives? Well, economic inequality is the main issue that it, we all are addressing. Environmental changes, the flood, what we're seeing in Houston, we need to address how things are going to affect us environmentally. For me, I think it's a balanced budget, a try to increase our job job situation and try to reduce our uh, housing inequality. <coughs> well, I, op opportunities for all, and that includes affordable housing throughout the city, living wage jobs, getting taking care of our streets and infrastructure, and um, I think we need to look at some neighborhood youth services coming back into our communities because we need those badly in all neighborhoods. I'm going to say health equity because health disparities are wealth disparities. And if you had a chance to read the DNT article where I received the <laughs> top endorsement, we need to look at jobs, economic development, housing, transportation, and the environment, and how it's more of a comprehensive uh, uh, approach that we need to take instead of segmenting them apart. The willingness of some weak need uh, public officials to uh, rubber stamp increasing fees and taxes and placing this burden on on the people that can least afford it. Systemic economic disparity and the imbalance of power away from the people that need it the most. Um, 
my top issue, economic equity. We just had a question about it. I have experience getting rid of um, uh, regressive fees in our city to help those at the bottom end of the social economic spectrum. Now we are arriving at our closing statement. At this time, we'll ask each candidate to give one minute closing statement. We will start with Rich Up the Grove. We have an opportunity with this election to really move our city council in a progressive direction. In the at-large race, you get two votes. You have a chance to really impact the way that we vote on issues in this city. As someone who has lived in poverty, who has seen education and a union job bring me out of that, as someone who is a father and a teacher and has worked with you throughout my life, I feel that I am well positioned to improve our city. I am passionate about this place. Duluth is better and can be even better than any city in our country. But we need city councilors who will take those difficult votes. And one of those was on protecting the waters of Lake Superior. When you wait on a vote like that, it almost always means never. That's a version of Martin Luther King. When you do what's right, when the, it's always the right time to do what's right. And standing up for our lake is always right, and I will always do that every time. The next candidate will be Renee Van um, Thanks, everybody, for coming. I uh, appreciate being able to learn from everybody. You guys sitting here with you guys and listening and learning is, is amazing for me to be able to be a better person. Thank you guys for that. I'm all about hard work, making sure we're safe, we have employment opportunities, and being an accessible person to get our needs met. I want to make sure that everybody in the 4th District, no matter where you live, no matter who you are, gets your needs met, gets listened to, gets talked with about the things you want, things you need, things you care about. I want to stay focused on people that really need some help there and try to help the district and ourselves move forward. Thank you. Our next candidate will be Brandon Sorbet. I would like to thank everybody for coming tonight and helping us with all these questions. It was really a great experience. My main thing is we must try to have a balanced budget so that way we can keep moving forward as a city so we can increase our <coughs> job base so we can have those great families coming back to Duluth to help us make Duluth even better. And along with those jobs, we have a better, more affordable housing something where everybody can try to get into a good house <coughs> or make their house bigger and better than it was before. So that's what I would like to see is more balanced budgets, a, more, a better job increase, and more housing equality. Our next candidate will be Barbara. Well, I want to uh, bring up the street improvement program because I think it's really important that everybody vote on this. Very, very important. Um, Economic growth um, is going to be helped if we have streets that people can drive on. You know, new employers don't want to come in to Duluth if they're seeing that we don't take care of stuff. And we need to take care of stuff. So that's one way we're going to be able to do it. And uh, the other thing is that we do need um, all kinds of housing all over our city. Single family dwellings, um, you know, um, we need... Um, Affordable housing, and we need supportive housing. That's very, very important. We have a lot of uh, mental health, health problems in this city, and um, we need some supportive housing for people who need that. And um, let's see. Um, okay, the important thing I just wanted to bring up because it didn't come up was the um, the um, one and one half percent sales tax. The next candidate will be Howie Hampson. Thank you. Tonight was, in my view, a, a real illustration of the, the choice that the people in the Lincoln Park, the Duluth Heights, and the Piedmont Heights need to make. Um, do you, my position is very clear. I'm all about continuing the fight, working as hard as I can as a person with a lot of uh, time on my hands and energy and passion for that district uh, to fight to hold the line on fees and increasing taxes. Um, it's a, it's a minor, as I said earlier, it's a minority position to be in, but it's really important that um, 
that, that the fourth district councilor listen to the people and react as we've heard a lot from Renee, especially tonight that we do that. Make no mistake, my background is my parents never had a job, ever, ever. I know poverty. I worked hard. I went out and I got my college education as a 61-year-old man. I'm now working towards my master's. What does that say? That talks about opportunity. That talks about hard work. And I'm proud of that, and I want to continue to be a double city councilor at all costs. Our next candidate will be Zach Filipovich. Yeah. Well, thank you, everyone, for being here. It's, this really shows that Duluth has really high... Uh, involved civic engagement and, and citizens, and that is so important. Um, I love the engagement here. It's clear that we have a lot of people committed to making our city better, and I'm, I'm one of you. As a council representative all of Duluth, I have seen how community-led discussions and conversations can lead to better policies. Um, I'm proud of the solid working relationships that I've built with um, community members, community leaders, business leaders, other uh, other political leaders that represent us down at, at our state capitol. I've been endorsed by a number of groups, including the Duluth DFL, Labor, ASME, the Duluth Firefighters, Stonewall DFL, the Minnesota Nurses Association, Teamsters, and Take Action Minnesota. These are relationships that I see um, as a reason why they endorse me. And until our economic disparities are addressed in a meaningful way, our growth that Duluth has seen is not going to be sustainable. Thank you very much. Our next candidate will be Janet Kennedy. Thank you everyone for coming here. I'm a lifelong Duluthian who utilized community services to get ahead. And I know that right now it's time that we make a change at our city council level to be a more inclusive leadership. And here's why. We currently have a gap on the city council and we know today and learn that policies affect everybody differently. The more diverse we have a policy making table, the better solutions we'll come up with. We have 11 year difference in life expectancies. We have people facing sy systemic barriers and unintentional consequences. Whether it's inadequate housing or allocation of resources, economic or job opportunities. I know that we will do better when everyone I s in our city has the opportunities to sustain a life. We need to make sure we have places where everyone can live, work, and play. And having lived in disparities all my life and continue to live every day, I know how to make a difference. Thank you. Our next candidate will be Tom Furman. Unlike the at-large, I'm running in the City Council 4th District. There's only one vote there. And you get to make one choice, and that happens on September 12th. It's an important election making sure that we have a good primary turnout. Now, you've heard from a variety of us about the different needs that we have for Duluth, and you've been able to start seeing some differences. One of the things I want to make sure I point out is that experience does not always come from the same places. I have a Master's in Business Administration. I have the knowledge, the skills, and abilities to be able to piece together what's right. And I can listen to people and figure out what we're really needing. Now, I can decipher a lot of these numbers very rapidly, and I have, and that is part of what separates me. The other part is I know how to communicate very clearly and efficiently, making sure that everybody knows where I stand, what's going on in my mind, because this is no longer a time of wishy-washy politics. This is a time to stand up and take a stand. Our community can start making a difference in people's lives in a major way, and that can happen right here, right now, September 12th our voting day. Our next candidate will be Richard L. Williams. Uh, there are imbalances in our, uh, our economy here uh, as far as jobs. Uh, unless you're interested in uh, working in the medical field, uh, there really isn't uh, a, a lot of choices uh, as far as uh, whether you want to stay or you want to go. Um, I feel that uh, we have to focus on um, manufacturing, um, uh, otherwise uh, the young people that, that train in, in Duluth here are, uh, they, they don't really have a, a manufacturing choice uh, for a job. So uh, uh, I, see a, I see a big inequality there. I mean, we, we have our <coughs> tourism, our tourism, which is a big industry, but it's not, it's not very uh, <coughs> as far as tourism. Uh, so 
Um, I think we have to focus on manufacturing. This concludes tonight's candidate forum for the City Council District 4 and at-large positions. A big thank you to PAC TV for filming tonight's forum. Please check out their listing for a schedule of viewing times. PAC TV will also be filming our upcoming forums, and you can check out our website for when those will be, as well as our League of Women Voters kickoff, which will be happening in September. When sponsoring forums like this, our purpose is to provide you with an opportunity to hear candidates discuss issues that are important to you. There is never enough time to cover all of the questions in a limited time setting such as this. If your questions were not addressed, please feel free to contact the candidate directly. We encourage you to exercise your right to vote on primary election day, Tuesday, September 12th, and on election day, Tuesday, November 7th. Those who are interested in finding out more information about same-day registration, voting district, and polling locations can talk with one of our members at the information table or go to www.mnvotes.org. Once again, we thank the candidates, One Roof Community Housing, the Lusperi Area Community Foundation, PAC-TV, and all of you for making this event possible. Thank you, and good night.